signs. They all have a purpose. In our travels, we've seen signs that are designed to both entertain and inform. For example, uh, Interstate 95 through the state of Maine. If you've ever gone along there, the signs that warn you about texting and encourage you to watch out for large animals are hilarious. I can't remember an example off the top of my head of one of them, but uh, if you ever get through there, check it out. Uh, Another is I-90 through North Dakota, which has very few highway signs, very few exits, and a whole lot of farmers' fields. And happily, the farmers put signs up along the right-of-way to tell you what they're growing, just to give you something to look at to stimulate your mind as you drive across that not very interesting part of America's heartland. Well, whatever the purpose, signs matter. We're going to start off today talking about the value of signs, and we'll end up talking about the reality of spiritual warfare, so I hope you'll stick around. I want to say welcome to everybody who's here and everybody who's there. Uh, My name is Jeff Loach. I'm the pastor here at St. Paul's, and we welcome you to worship. And if you're joining us for the first time, especially online, then please uh, hit the like and subscribe and notification bell, and we'll be glad to keep in touch with you in some way. And the connection card is available for all of us to make use of to be in touch, and that's through stpaulsnobledon.ca slash connect. There is a potluck lunch today. You've come on the right day, uh, and I, I have been told that uh, lots of people need to stay because there's lots of food. So even if you didn't bring anything, stick around because there's uh, lots of good food and conversation to enjoy. And there will be uh, coffee beforehand, I think, perhaps not for very long, but uh, feel free to stick around, go to the gym, grab some coffee, and then uh, stay for lunch. Drive through prayer has resumed and we'll be gathering on Wednesday from 4.30 till 6 in the parking lot. And the, the folks who are looking after drive through prayer would encourage your participation, whether it's by coming and helping to uh, advertise that we are offering prayer or by praying for folks or uh, even by uh, coming and being prayed for. We would be glad to have you. Uh, Ron and Marjorie Carnegie have been part of St. Paul's for many years, and we recently received word that they're moving to Morrisburg, Ontario. Look it up. It's a place. (laughs) Think Upper Canada Village. As you go, friends, please know that an open door will always remain here for you at St. Paul's, and we bless you in the name of the Lord as you venture forth in a new phase of life, which cannot be easy to undertake at uh, at a particular stage of life, but we thank you for your service to the Lord and for your friendship. Uh, We're going to miss you, and we wish you every blessing as you move along. Let's pray together for them. Father, we thank you for Ron and Marjorie, and we pray that as they make this move, you will bless them with good health, with new friends, and a church family in their community where they can serve and be ministered to as the word of God is rightly preached. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you'll take time to greet Ron and Marjorie after the service. If you don't know who they are, just wave so that the people here know who you are. Uh, Ron uh, periodically hands me interesting material, of which I got another bag this morning, uh, along with... uh, both an inside and outside master key for the building, so you know that this is a significant step. Psalm 113, verses 1 to 4 says this, Praise the Lord. Yes, give praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord now and forever, from everywhere, from east to west. Praise the name of the Lord. For the Lord is high above the nations. His glory is higher than the heavens. Please stand and we'll worship the Lord together. Oh, my God. 
worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing his wonderful love. to Kiara who is playing for us on the piano this morning and grateful to Jerry who is going to read for us from Psalm 55. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my cry for help. Please listen and answer me for I'm overwhelmed by my troubles. My enemies shout at me making loud and wicked threats. They bring trouble on me and angrily hunt me down. My heart pounds in my chest. The terror of death assaults me. Fear and trembling overwhelm me, and I can't stop shaking. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, that I could fly away and rest. I would fly away to the quiet of the wilderness. How quickly I would escape from this wild storm of hatred. Confuse them, Lord, and frustrate their plans, for I see violence and conflict in the city. Its walls are patrolled day and night against invaders, but the real danger is the wickedness within the city. Everything is falling apart. Threats and cheating are rampart in the streets. It is not an enemy who haunts me. I could bear that. It's not my foes who so arrogantly insult me. I could have hidden from them. Instead, it is you, my equal, my companion and close friend. What a good fellowship we once enjoyed as we walked together to the house of God. Let death stalk my enemies. 
Let the grave swallow them alive, for evil makes its home within them. But I will call on the Lord, and the Lord will rescue me. Morning, noon, and night. I cry out in my distress, and the Lord hears my voice. He ransoms me and keeps me safe from the battle waged against me, though many still oppose me. God, who has ruled forever, will hear them and humble them. For my enemies refuse to change their ways. They do not fear God. As for my companion, he betrayed his friends. He broke his promises. His word, words are as smooth as butter, but in his heart is war. His words are soothing as a lotion, but underneath are daggers. Give your burdens to the Lord, and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. But you, O oh God, will send the wicked down to the pit of destruction. Murderers and liars will die young, die young, but I am trusting you to save them. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jerry. You noticed, I'm sure, the emotion with which she read that, and that was not put on emotion by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and it reminds me of just how visceral some of the Psalms can be. A lot of people are afraid to express emotion to God, but the reality is that every possible emotion exists within the body of 150 Psalms. And uh, so let me encourage you, if you're, if you're not sure about being able to be emotional before the Lord, read the Psalms. You'll find that there's a lot of it there, and Psalm 55 is one example. Let's pray. Lord, we hear the psalmist's cry for your help, and we feel that cry in our own hearts. How deeply we feel the need for your presence in our lives, which you have promised by your Holy Spirit. How we praise you. We confess that sometimes our hearts are calloused toward the need for your presence, and we feel as though we could just carry on all by ourselves. Forgive us for thinking that we can take even one breath without your grace and mercy. Remind us, as the psalmist said, to give our burdens to you that you will take care of us and not permit the godly to slip and fall. We thank you for your presence in our lives and in the lives of our church's leaders here at St. Paul's. We pray for church leaders everywhere that you will fill them with your Holy Spirit and bring new life to congregations by your grace. We uphold those who are sick, that you will minister to them and restore them. We remember those who are recovering from surgery and those who will receive operations in the coming weeks. And we pray for our world in its many faceted turmoil. Bring peace and safety to war-torn regions. Speak into situations where there are battles unseen. Equip your people with the full armor of God so that we will go into battle protected from the wiles of the devil. And speak your word to us with clarity, we pray, that we will apply what we learn and build your kingdom in this place and around the world for Jesus' precious sake. Amen. Sign, sign, everywhere a sign. Knew the song, had to look up the band. Five Man Electrical Band, 1971. Anybody remember the name of the band? Oh, look at some of you old people. Way to go. <laughs> Not that old. Uh, we see signs everywhere telling us to stop or yield or drive a certain speed, and these are pretty obvious signs directing us to do certain things for our good or the good of society at large. We obey them to the delight of the police, to the appreciation of fellow motorists, and probably to the disdain of auto body shop owners everywhere. 
But there are other signs, signs that point us to things. There's the sign that says bump ahead, telling us we're going to encounter a bit of a heave or a bit of a hole in the road ahead of us. I remember when I was writing my learner's permit test, my 365, as we called it in the day, one of the, it was multiple choice, right? And when this sign came up, one of the choices for what that sign meant was factory ahead. Some things, I mean, I can barely remember what I had for breakfast this morning, but I can remember that from a long time ago. Or there's the sign I look for in many public buildings and in every airport I visit, and that is the sign for the men's room. I drink about four liters of water every day, so I never pass up an opportunity to find one of those signs. But in case of the sign saying there's a bump ahead or the sign indicating there's a urinal or two behind this door... They are not the object themselves, but they point to what is beyond. The book of Revelation is full of signs like that, and we're going to encounter a few of them as we delve into chapter 12 of this mysterious book. I'm going to read the first four verses of Revelation 12, and we're going to park there for a minute, and I'll let you paint a picture in your mind of what this scene looks like. Again, remember, this is a vision that John is having. Revelation 12, 1 to 4. Then I witnessed in heaven an event of great significance. I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. Then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns with seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky, and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. Jeez. I don't even know how to spell that, so that's not in the notes, right? The New Living Translation refers to this as an event of significance, right? The translation is helpful because the word that's used in the original language of the New Testament there is, is the Greek word semeon, from which we get the term semantic. Uh, and it refers to the significance or meaning of something, but literally a semeon in Greek is a sign, so other translations, like the New International Version, will say a great sign appeared in heaven. This is a helpful reminder for us that what we're reading about is symbolic. It's a word picture that points to something beyond itself. I say this to set your minds at ease, lest you think that the day is going to come where you are going to be standing somewhere and you are going to witness a pregnant woman with a dragon ready to go after her. Remember, this is apocalyptic literature. John is writing something that would have been clearly understood by the first hearers and readers, but he had to write cryptically to keep the Romans from, I mean, he'd already been exiled. The next step would have been that he would have been executed. So, uh, you know, he had to write cryptically to avoid execution. So you might ask, who is represented by this dragon? Well, the easy and obvious answer is Satan, and that is the correct answer. And later in the chapter, we'll see that's the case. The word for dragon is related to the word for serpent, which is used in verse 9, that we'll see in a bit, making it more plain that this is the devil that we're talking about here. But what about the pregnant woman? Who is represented by her, and what about her child? Well, stay tuned. We'll get back to that in a few minutes. Just remember that this is a sign, a symbol, not a literal depiction of events past, present, or future. Doesn't mean it's not real or that it's not going to happen. It just means that it's going to happen, but in a less obvious and more symbolic kind of way. Let's carry on. This is verse 5. She gave birth to a son who was to rule all nations with an iron rod. And her child was snatched away from the dragon and was caught up to God and to his throne. 
And the woman fled into the wilderness where God had prepared a place to care for her for 1,260 days. Now, that's three and a half years is the significance of which we looked at last uh, couple weeks. Then there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. Now, Michael is only one of two angels named in the Bible. The other one is Gabriel. Yeah. Uh, But Michael is seen as the archangel, the chief angel, if you will. Uh, Jewish people see Michael as their guardian prince, according to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, defending them from the angels of the surrounding nations. Verse 8, and the dragon lost the battle, and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, this ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. So this is representative of the heavenly victory won by the Lord Jesus Christ. Then I heard a loud shouting, loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. Just as the saints worship before the throne of God day and night, so, as we've uh, seen here, the one who accuses them before our God does so day and night as well. And they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in the heavens rejoice. But terror will come on the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he has little time. When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child in the same way that Pharaoh pursued the Israelites in the wilderness in the Exodus. All kinds of Old Testament imagery here. But she was given two wings like those of a great eagle so she could fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. There she would be cared for and protected from the dragon for a time, two times, and half a time. Three and a half years. The great eagle is symbolic of God's help, by the way. As we heard the psalmist uh, cry for the wings to be able to flee to the wilderness away from his enemies and that is what is thought of in this image as well then the dragon tried to drown the woman with a flood of water that flowed from his mouth probably points to slander but the earth helped her by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that gushed out from the mouth of the dragon. And the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children, all who keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony for Jesus. Then the dragon took his stand on the shore beside the sea. Whew. Trippy stuff, eh? Uh, What can we possibly make of this? Well, a helpful piece of the puzzle, as I alluded to a minute ago, is that this whole scene could be read as a version of the story of the Exodus. When the Israelites were set free from Egypt and they were making their way to the promised land and Pharaoh chased them and there were all these plagues and so on and so forth. Despite many efforts to try to read things into the identity of the woman, though, she is a symbol who points to the faithful remnant, the faithful remnant of the church of Jesus, both Jewish and Gentile. Now, there were people in the first century who saw an allusion here to uh, Greek and Egyptian mythology, which may have helped them understand the true meaning of the vision better, but such illusions would be lost on most of us, or at least people like me whose Greek and Egyptian mythology are worse than rusty. The Old Testament images of the sun and the moon and the stars would confirm Joseph from Joseph's dream in Genesis 37, the whole concept of this being like the Exodus. The faithful remnant of the Jews are what would give birth to this child whose identity is certainly the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So in this vivid chapter, we have an image of the faithful people of God from uh, among whom the Savior would be birthed, whose saving work Satan would try to thwart unsuccessfully. We also see images that point to the earliest days of creation when the serpent tempted Eve. Uh, The Old Testament imagery is all over a passage like this, which is why you should never undertake a study in the book of Revelation without first having read the Old Testament at least a couple of times uh, to appreciate it all the more. Some of the first hearers or readers of this vision would have thought that the child would be a god or maybe the emperor, but John reinterprets the myth so that the child is Jesus whose enthronement begins at the cross. But really, what possibly can we draw from something like this? Where does the rubber hit the road? Well, I actually have four notions for you to consider. And the first is this. What the church has commonly called the Great Tribulation really is the entire period of time from the ascension of Jesus to his return. In the past, I've alluded to some theological frameworks that have been imposed upon the book of Revelation or any New Testament scripture that points to the end times. But rather than try to make the Bible fit a framework... I'm a fan of letting the Bible speak for itself. And I I sense from many references to tribulation in the book of Revelation that the time frame is not limited to some point in the future, but is being lived out even now as it has been since the risen Lord ascended into heaven. Of course, the degree of tribulation or trouble or persecution will vary greatly from time to time. There have been periods of history when the suffering of the church has seemed to be non-existent, but that's looking at it through very Western eyes. Anywhere the mission of God is extended, there will be resistance, pushback, the potential even for suffering. What this requires of us is a mindset that understands that being a follower of Jesus is not like being a member of a club, right? There are some clubs that have service requirements, other ones have financial requirements, and a few probably have no requirements at all. But the church is not so much an organization or an institution that exists for its own benefit, as much as it is a movement of God that is seeking to change the world by changing hearts and lives, And if we're part of a movement that's seeking to change the world, you know there's going to be resistance because people are not fond of change. And when you try to change people's minds about something they're already comfortable with, persecution may follow. In a sense, you know, we bring this on ourselves, but God knew this would happen. The New Testament in many places is quick to point out that if you follow Jesus, at some level you're going to suffer at some point in your life. And this has been true from the time that Jesus went to be with the Father, and it will be true until he consummates time as we know it by returning to judge the earth. In Revelation 12, the dragon, Satan, is waiting to attack Jesus and the church as they seek to undertake their mission to make disciples. This happens in many different ways, and we simply need to be ready for it. Our practice of personal spiritual disciplines is largely what makes us ready. So don't go looking for some great sign of a tribulation that's to come. It's already here. Second point of encouragement that we find in this passage is the value of retreat and engagement, what I call strategic withdrawal. What do I mean by that? Well, verse 6 says that the woman, when she had given birth, fled to the wilderness where God had prepared a place for her for 1,260 days, three and a half years. Often the wilderness, the desert, the bush, the forest, someplace different than we normally function, is a great place to meet the Lord. When we go camping, even if it's just an overnight at a nearby provincial park or something, I find my pace slows down. I start to notice things that I would otherwise overlook, things like flowers. 
My wife grows flowers at the manse, but truth be told, I hardly ever look at them, not because they aren't lovely, but because I'm always in a hurry going to or from or doing something. But when we go camping, we might take a walk or a bike ride, and I'll see daisies or devil's paintbrushes or trilliums or any number of other flowers that I would be hopeless to attempt to name. And when my pace of life slows down and I notice the things that God has made in nature, my heart and my mind are drawn closer to him. Same thing can be true for me in a retreat center. Most, uh, most church retreats that happen tend to be focused on teaching or planning or visioning, which has its place. But retreats should also include a component of silence and solitude. Desert times, wilderness times invoke the opportunity for silence and solitude where we can drown out the noise with quiet so we can hear from the Lord and let his spirit minister to us. These are times when we can avoid being with others for a time and be alone with God. These are optimal times, by the way, to remember the most ignored feature of your cell phone. And that is the off button. Sometimes vibrate or airplane mode aren't enough. You need to shut it off and walk away. But what if so-and-so calls? Well, first of all, you probably have voicemail on your line. And if you don't, so-and-so can call back. You know, that, 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 whole, that all works, right? You don't have to answer the phone if it rings. You might also think, how on earth can I make time for retreat, for strategic withdrawal? Well, you schedule it ahead of time. You put it in your calendar, and you don't let anything violate it. This means setting boundaries, being able to say no to something in favor of saying yes to something more important at that time. And building your relationship with God is important, especially since you're going to need it to be as strong as possible as you prepare for whatever may be your season of tribulation. So take time for retreat so you can engage with the world and make disciples. Third point is this, understand that spiritual warfare on a cosmic level is steadily ongoing. Spiritual warfare is one of those polarizing subjects for God's people. Some people have an unhealthy fixation on it, and other people ignore it or don't even believe it exists. Neither of those approaches actually is quite helpful. Spiritual warfare is real. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, which is true of everyone who follows Jesus, you should be attuned to the reality that spiritual battles are taking place. Remember one time, many years ago, we had some sort of lunch downstairs after church, and uh, there was a person who, as I observed this individual, was visibly distraught, troubled in some way. And I wasn't aware of what the trouble was at the moment, but I felt led to pray from across the room for that person. And so I extended my hand in that person's direction and prayed and uh, asked the Lord to cast out of her whatever was causing this visible agitation. At that moment, her trouble appeared to calm down. I didn't know the person well enough to actually go over and have a conversation at that point. All I knew is that as a follower of Jesus, there was some sort of spiritual battle going on and I needed to contribute in some way any believer can do this right you don't need credentials all you need to be is a follower of jesus who is attuned to the holy spirit and the reality of spiritual warfare sometimes people get spooked out by spiritual warfare but there's no need to do that because god is sovereign he's in charge of even these unseen cosmic battles and the devil's time as revelation 12 shows us is limited I've said it before, I'll say it again. I have read to the end of the story, and I know who wins. In the meantime, talk to God about what may be your role as a disciple of Jesus in the realm of spiritual battle. 
Fourth, and I think this is a crucial point that many of us miss when we sign up with Jesus. Witness is worth more than our lives. Listen again to Revelation 12, 11. And they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. They are the disciples of Jesus engaged in cosmic spiritual warfare. Him is Satan. But the second part of the sentence is the most important part. They did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. For us, contemporary North Americans, young enough not to have lived through a major global conflict, this is hard for us to fathom. If you talk to any of the remaining World War II veterans in this country, most of them were teenagers when they enlisted to go against the Third Reich. Their whole lives lay ahead of them, but they were not afraid to lay down their lives for the sake of freedom. They were not prepared to stay home and watch some crazy man mobilize an entire nation to attempt to overtake a continent and eradicate an entire ethnic people. Many of them paid the price. And those who came home to tell the story, in many cases, could not tell the story. So horrific was it. These men and women did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. And our freedom from that brand of tyranny today, we owe to them. Our hearts lean into this, right? We appreciate patriotism and living in a free society. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. But how many of us are prepared to say, oh, Jesus, we stand on guard for thee? We are reluctant to do for the gospel what we would do for the nation. People die every day, and most of them die in their sins. And most of the time, we are content to let that happen. Satan assaults the world and even the church every day, and most of the time, we are content to let that happen. Yet fighting the battle is not rocket science. You don't need a degree in theology or a lifetime of experience to engage in spiritual warfare. You need a heart for the gospel and a heart for people who are far from Jesus. In North American society, this is sort of a new thing for us because until about 60 years ago, churches just naturally self-populated. Babies were born, they were baptized and welcomed into the church. Families moved to a new community, they found a new church home, and everything was great. Everybody had a connection of one sort or another. But that all changed with the 1960s. And since then, the church has had to be intentional about going out and engaging the world, not merely waiting for the world to come in and show up on the church's terms. So when we attempt new endeavors as a church, it's not for the sake of novelty, or, but it's for the sake of reaching people who are dead in their sins and need an encounter with Jesus. It's why we sing newer songs with newer instruments. It's why we read from newer translations of the Bible that actually use English we speak. It's why we don't advertise like it's 1958. It's why we have a presence at community functions and invite the community to make use of our facilities. It's why we focus on equipping you to make, bring Jesus to your neighbors, just as I seek to bring Jesus to my neighbors. And I can only be in one place at a time. It's all about fighting the spiritual battle, realizing our witness is worth more than our lives. The great British theologian F.F. F. Bruce once said this, The only means of resisting the enemy's attack is patient endurance and faithful confession. That's why I focus on teaching you the Bible, because right belief results in right practice. And right practice draws other people into relationship with Jesus. Your faithful witness, my faithful witness, is a forward attack in the spiritual warfare that goes on in this time of great tribulation, where we participate in a cycle of engagement and retreat. Sometimes it feels like we're not going to win the war. Feels like an uphill battle that we're engaging in, if we're even engaging in the battle at all. 
But again, I remind you of the overarching theme of the book of Revelation. God is sovereign. He is in charge. We fight battles now just as the first readers and hearers of the book fought battles then. But when it's all said and done, Jesus will be victorious. And as we are willing to lay down our lives for the sake of the eternal destiny of others, we partner with Jesus in the victory over sin and death and the evil one. As much as Revelation 12 seems otherworldly, and to an extent it is, it is a symbolic vision that calls the church to greater things, to evangelistic faithfulness. If you were here in the 1980s, not many of us were, but some of you remember this. This congregation was at its largest it's when this fine building was erected. And you remember the outreach efforts that the congregation undertook under the leadership of my late colleague, Stan Self. I never knew Stan personally. I knew his brother, Russell, and of course, his son, Harvey, and grandson, Alan. But the Self family has had a reputation for being selfless, for being willing to do whatever it took to reach people for Jesus. And Stan modeled that for this congregation causing the church to rise up and reach out to the community. The community, of course, is a different place today than it was in the 1980s, just as culture is different as well. It will take different practices to engage with our neighbors today. But whatever those practices may be, we need to be committed to the reason why we undertake them. To play our role in the spiritual battle and to lead more people to know and love and serve Jesus Christ. And it starts with us knowing and loving and serving Jesus Christ because the eternal destiny of people we love rests on that commitment. Let's pray. Father, the call to battle is sounding and we need to enlist you know how hard this is for us, so fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we will not be able to resist this call to battle. Strengthen our faith and our practice of faith so that we are ready, fully equipped with the full armor of God and prepared to do battle with our winsome sharing of the good news that Jesus died for our sins, rose again to bring us eternal life ascended to your right hand to pray for us and promise to come again to bring this battle to a close. Until that happens, Lord, make us ready by giving us times of quiet with you, times away from the world and its demands, times when you can minister to our souls in ways that we cannot understand or imagine, let alone bring on ourselves. Guide us by your word and Holy Spirit, and fit us for what we must do for your glory and for the sake of the good news of Jesus. Amen. If you're ready to enlist in the Lord's army for this spiritual battle, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Uh, you can speak to me over lunch downstairs if you're here, or uh, you can hit me up on the connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect, and I'll be glad to pray for you and encourage you as we partner with the Lord in drawing more people to him. We're going to sing Goodness of God. Please stand.
In one respect, our gifts to God's mission through St. Paul's are our contributions to the war effort in the spiritual battle that we are fighting to seek to lead our friends and neighbors to Jesus. So thank you for your support. You can give using the plate and envelopes that are on the table in the lobby at the door as you head out for coffee and then lunch. Uh, or you can uh, go by mail to 5750 King Road in Nobleton or make use of any of the electronic means that are so easy noted on the screen. Thank you for your generosity. Let's close our worship time together by singing King of Kings. This is a song that really tells the story of the gospel in, uh, in long form. to the world to the praise of the king of kings 
go into the world knowing that there is a battle to fight, but that that battle is won because of what Jesus has done for us. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us and those we love this day and always. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank mm-hmm. you.